Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to CSIS. And thanks for joining us on this beautiful Spring Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm Steve Morrison. I'm Senior Vice President at CSIS and Director of the Global Health Policy Center here. Before I offer some brief framing remarks, um, I wish to thank several individuals who were uh, who made very substantial contributions to pulling this uh, event together. From CSIS, um, uh, the most single most important personality in all of this is my colleague uh, Matt Fisher. Uh, who, uh, who has been uh, there indefatig indefatigably since the beginning. Uh, from our Ideas Lab, uh, which produced the short video, which we will uh, air in a few minutes, uh, Beverly Kirk, uh, the senior producer, Paul France, who did the graphics work, and Chris Latondra, who did the editing. Thanks very much for uh, the, the, your expedited work in, all, in pulling this all together on a very short schedule. Uh, we're delighted we're able to do this event jointly with the CSIS Middle East program, and a special thanks to Rebecca Shirazi uh, for all her extensive support in getting the word out, and to John Alterman and Haim Malka, uh, uh, the, the uh, leadership in that program for agreeing to move ahead uh, with this partnership. The impetus for this event rests um, with my close friend and colleague, Len Rubenstein, senior scholar at the Center for Public Health and Human Rights at the Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg School of Public Health, He's one of our speakers here today at the round table. He's been at the forefront for many years of work focused um, upon violent conflicts and the implications uh, uh, for the health sector. We've made available for you today a copy of, a, of an essay, that uh, an excellent piece of work that he kindly produced for us in early uh, 2012, Protection of Health Care in Armed and Civil Conflict. Um, the, um, uh, in preparing for this event, we, we also benefited enormously from the generosity of several other individuals. Uh, Claudia Bloom from MSF Toronto, uh, the press officer there went out of her way to share with us some footage you'll see uh, in the video. Rick Brennan, the Director of Emergency Risk Management at WHO in Geneva. Uh, Marcus Geyser and, and Mark Steinbeck from the International Committee of the Red Cross, both of whom are kindly here today with us, uh, uh, very generous uh, in sharing their insights. Uh, Marcus is the deputy head of the regional delegation here in, for U.S. and Canada, and uh, Mark is the medical advisor, Mark Steinbeck, on the effects of weapons for the ICRC. Uh, we're here today to discuss the attacks uh, by the, the systematic attacks by the government of Syria and the related actions by various armed opposition groups that are gravely damaging hospitals, clinics, and other facilities, injuring and intimidating health providers, and disrupting essential care for countless Syrians who remain uh, acutely vulnerable and in need of medications, continuous care, and emergency care. We're here to put a spotlight on this phenomenon, to understand the trajectory and possible scenarios that lie ahead, and to think concretely about what can and cannot be done in, in this uh, urgent situation. We'll hear from two individuals uh, who have firsthand recent experience on the ground inside Syria on this particular uh, special, ish, uh, sp special subject. Uh, Zahir Salul, who's come to, come to us today kindly from Chicago. He is uh, with the Syrian American Medical Society. Uh, and Stephen Cornish from MSF uh, Canada. Uh, we're also joined by a senior official from the Department of State, from the uh, Obama administration at the Department of State, Dorothy Shea, who oversees the U.S. humanitarian response uh, uh, in the uh, Bureau of Population, Refugee, and Migration. She heads up the regional office responsible for that work. And of course, we're joined, as I mentioned earlier, by Len Rubenstein from Johns Hopkins. We will not today, I wish to emphasize, be debating uh, U uh, U.S. political and security policy choices. And I think it's important to emphasize that. We're going to keep our focus upon the subject that I delineated just a moment ago. So we're not going to debate whether the merits of arming rebels, uh, the establishing a no-fly zone, uh, whether we've crossed a red line in terms of chemical weapons and what that then triggers. These are terribly important policy debates, um, but we're not going to treat those today, and I just want to uh, uh, make that clear. We will hear, as we will hear, the targeted and willful systematic destruction of the health sector in Syria is truly extraordinary, and it's conducted at a pace and a scale that are unprecedented. And it is, of course, one dimension, one important vital dimension of a much larger, extraordinary catastrophe that is unfolding now in Syria. 
Uh, as we'll hear from our speakers, the, the macro indicators are quite stunning. In a population of 23 million, 70,000 killed, over 6,500 in March, 1.5 million refugees. Just to remind you that this is now estimated to exceed 3 million by the end of 2013. A year ago, the po refugee population was under 60,000. And this flood of refugees, as we'll hear, has now become its own vector of regional destabilization. Lebanon and Jordan each struggle to accommodate roughly half a million refugees. Doubling or tripling those levels is a staggering new level of human suffering. It's also an accelerating security crisis for those host countries themselves and for the region. Internally displaced populations, 4.25 million. Civilians in need of emergency humanitarian relief on a daily basis, 7 million. One in three, every three citizens still in the country of Syria. As we'll hear, this is a situation that's highly uncertain, filled with tensions and frustrations. Will there be a continued steep trajectory of violence as we've seen with the government able to continue to sustain these assaults? Will there be a precipitous collapse? Will there be some negotiated settlement? We know this is a war that defies expectations. We know that it has become a proxy conflict increasingly of a broader Shia-Sunni confrontation. We know that it's a powerful magnet attracting Islamic armed Islamic extremists onto the battlefield. We know that it's having profound spillover effects into Lebanon, Jordan, and elsewhere. We also know that there's clear danger, clear and present danger of large-scale chemical attacks, which could have profound direct health impacts on citizens. The stockpiles are not visible. They're distributed widely, could be deployed through the Shabia with a certain level of deniability. We'll hear more about that. With regard to health, there's, not much, there's much that we do not know with a lot of precision. But as we'll hear from our speakers today, there are certain large realities that are, that are coming into focus. 30,000 doctors, half of them now having departed, one third of hospitals non-functioning, half damaged by fighting, continued hardline government defiance of international humanitarian law, fierce opposition to cross-line relief and cross-border, increased evidence of armed opposition groups defying the neutrality and impartiality of health workers, the disruption of Syrian production of essential medicines, disruption of routine immunization programs, heightened mental, mental disorders, resurgent uh, outbreaks of measles and others, and acute vulnerabilities, obviously, of pregnant women uh, and children. We'll talk today about what can be done in the near term and in the, and in the long term. In the near term, I think we'll hear from our speakers about the appeals for high-level action. What would that take at the UN Security Council elsewhere? What kind of pragmatic steps can be taken to better protect and preserve the health infrastructure from wholesale destruction? How do you strengthen local, worthy local capacities of the many courageous folks that are struggling against these realities? How do we advance cross-line dialogues on humanitarian pauses for resumed immunizations? And how do you crack the code on cross-line and cross-border operations? And, of course, how do you begin to develop active measures of protection against populations that are vulnerable to chemical attacks? In the long term, there's a question of accountability of those responsible for these egregious acts and planning for reconstruction. So it's a broad a number of issues that are coming forward. We have among the best experts here today for this discussion, and I thank you all for being with us uh, uh, for it. We're going to open with a very brief two-minute video montage that, as I said, uh, Beverly, Paul, and Chris kindly put together on an urgent basis. So we will watch this, then I'll invite our guests to our roundtable. Each of our guests, our roundtable speakers, will kick off with five to seven minutes of opening summary remarks. We'll have a bit of a roundtable discussion afterwards, and then we'll open the floor for your comments and questions to come back to our roundtable folks. And we will, uh, we will attempt to close, close up by four. So thank you very much. If we could uh, view the video. The violence in Syria rages on day after day in village after village, leaving no one untouched. Not even the medical professionals trying desperately to care for the wounded and dying. The Assad regime has increasingly and systematically targeted doctors, hospitals, healthcare workers, and patients. And the armed opposition has also defied the impartiality and neutrality of medical services. 
Several organizations are mobilized to protect health workers and sustain services. The World Health Organization, the International Committee of the Red Cross, Syrian NGOs, Doctors Without Borders, and others. These media clips from Al Jazeera and Doctors Without Borders shed light on the issue. These doctors have come from all over the world to the border between Turkey and Syria. They're all Syrians. None of them can practice openly in their home country. So they're reduced to smuggling medical supplies in and hoping for the best. It's no easy task smuggling this quantity of equipment into a war zone. There are no more hospitals left here. They've either been bombed out by President Bashar al-Assad's army or transformed into bases for rebel fighters. Instead, the injured are brought to these makeshift treatment rooms set up in people's homes and basements. But these so-called clinics are struggling to cope. There are few doctors and little medicine. MSF is working inside Syria, where it has opened three hospitals. The teams also supply drugs and train Syrians who give first aid to the wounded near the front line. Zahia, um, we've asked you to um, open things up. Uh, you've been deeply and personally involved uh, in this crisis and um, uh, in the response and mobilizing uh, the constituency represented by the Syrian American Medical Council. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Why don't you kick things off with some, uh, some opening remarks? Sure. Thank you, Steve, for inviting me. Uh, and, uh, I enjoy always the uh, visit to DC, especially that the weather is better than Chicago <laughs> for today. Um, and uh, I thank also for my co-speakers for being with us. And I'm, uh, I feel uh, excited to, um, to listen to what they have to add. Just came in from uh, Aleppo. By the way, I'm the only physician in the group, so I'm going to use some uh, medical terminology. I'm a critical care specialist practice in Chicago president of the Syrian American Medical Society. I'm also probably the only person who has direct connection to Syria. Uh, I was raised in Syria. My family is still in the city of Homs uh, in Syria. Uh, and uh, I have a connection to Bashar al-Assad. Uh, he was my classmate. We graduated in the same year. Uh, but that's not a good thing. Uh, <laughs> I want to highlight that. But anyway, uh, came in from the city of Aleppo um, last week and uh, part of the field assessment of what's happening in the medical field in Aleppo. Uh, Syrian American Medical Society, like uh, Doctors Without Border, have been doing um, a lot of medical relief in Syria, supporting physicians, hospitals, uh, building an infrastructure for the healthcare system that is kind of underground, uh, secretive, so physicians can see patients and treat them and do surgeries without being bombed or shelled. Uh, so I was meeting with the director of the Aleppo Medical Council, and uh, um, his name is Dr. Abdelaziz. Um, he's uh, an attending, a surgeon in the University of Aleppo uh, who left his post uh, about a year ago to oversee the medical care in the area that is under the control of the opposition in the city of Aleppo. So he oversees the work of 10 hospitals. And we um, toured uh, with him uh, over five hospitals among the 10. And uh, what you are seeing is basically a reflection of what Steve was what what, uh, describing in his report. Um, destruction, systematic destruction of the healthcare system in Syria. Aleppo is a major city uh, of about five uh, or six million people before the crisis. The area that is under the control of the opposition has three million people, 10 hospitals. It has no CT scan. It has no, um, uh, it has only 10 incubators for uh, neonatals. Uh, it has uh, only 10 dialysis machine. Uh, it has, uh, it's running out of uh, saline solutions, IV solution. Oral antibiotics is not available when the time when I was there. I saw a physician who was getting IV antibiotics because he has bronchitis or pneumonia 
and he was not, he didn't have access to oral antibiotics. Uh, uh, but in spite of that, in spite of the shortages of many basic medical needs and medications, the hospitals and the medical community in Aleppo uh, were ready for a chemical attack. So in front of every hospital, you have a tent uh, that is posted. It was created locally, actually, and it has three sections. So uh, they are expecting uh, another chemical uh, attack. And uh, so these uh, tents that is created locally, and Syrians are very uh, creative, by the way. Uh, I'm not saying that because the, I'm Syrian. But uh, the first part would be uh, for the patients when they come in, uh, they will uh, remove their clothing. The second part for washing them from the chemical weapon agent. And the third part to put a gown before they enter the emergency room. Because in the previous uh, attacks in Aleppo, people from the medical personnel who treated patients who had exposure, uh, actually some of them had um, symptoms. And one of them had a cardiac arrest, one of the nurses who treated patients. Um, besides the destruction that you see in the public hospitals, I saw two public hospitals, one of the best hospitals in Aleppo before the crisis, who were completely looted and right now serve as a base for some of the military battalions. One of them is the eye, specialized eye hospitals in Aleppo, and the other one is a children's hospital in Aleppo. Um, so the situation is really bad. Uh, besides the uh, destruction of the public health care system, uh, there is no, uh, there is no uh, garbage collection. Uh, there is uh, a lot of displacement and crowding. Uh, the poor um, hygiene because of lack of electricity and sometimes water. Lack of diesel fuel. Um, and because of that, you have a res resurgence of some of the epidemics that it was not there before. So you have increased numbers of hepatitis A uh, epidemics. You have uh, increased uh, number of Leishmania, which is a, a disease that is localized to the uh, area of Aleppo, caused by a parasite. Uh, and it's transmitted by a sand fly, which increases when you have a garbage in the, um, uh, in the area, uh, because there is no garbage collection and disposal. You have resurgence of other uh, uh, waterborne diseases. Uh, the Syrian American Medical Society and other NGOs have been trying to help by providing uh, training to the physicians so they can deal with the situation by trying uh, by sending medical supplies across the border uh, through Turkey and Jordan. Of course, uh, people who are doing that, they're risking their lives. Uh, because in Syria, if you are a physician who is caught uh, uh, treating patients from the other side, that will risk your life. And many of the physicians, unfortunately, have been detained, tortured, and killed. Uh, I have a report of 107 physicians who have been killed in Syria so far. And this is an underestimate. Uh, some of the reports say that the number is about 130. One of them, uh, and it's available here in the back, uh, is Dr. Ali al Um <coughs> And his number in the list is 104. Uh, he was um, uh, in the city of Dara. He's a cardiologist. And uh, early in the crisis, when there were demonstrations in the city of Dara, and the security forces responded to the demonstration by uh, attacking the demonstrators. So that the demonstrators went to one of the local mosques and uh, they were there uh, under siege. And uh, some of them were injured, so they started to ask for help. So Dr. Al Mahamid uh, took his car, drove his car, to, and he went to that area. And uh, the security um, uh, system blocked him from going to that area. He told them, I'm a cardiologist, I just want to treat the patients. So they shot him in the eye and the chest, and he died in March 23rd, 2011. This is one of 130 physicians who have been killed in Syria. Many of them were detained. Uh, I was just talking of, to one of my friends who detained for 12 days because um, the accusation was that he was helping the opposition by sending them serum, uh, saline serum, and also treating some of the patients in his clinic. Uh, so he was detained for 12 days uh, in the um, prison, in one of the prisons in, in Damascus. Uh, he told me that at one time uh, the uh, interrogator put a gun in his uh, head and he told him, you better ac admit uh, what, you, uh, what you have done. But in spite of that, because he knows that if he admitted of these crimes, which is treating patients uh, who's not supposed to treat, he would have uh, spent the rest of his life in the prison. He did not admit and then he was let go. Then he uh, smuggled himself and his family to Lebanon, then to Turkey. And he's been in Turkey now for the past year or so looking for a work. This is one of uh, hundreds of physicians who had to flee Syria because they feel that if they stayed in Syria, they will be targeted or harassed or prevented from doing their job, which is treating patients. Um, I have a friend, a physician from the city of Homs. He just called me last week and he said, I've been in Homs now from the beginning of the crisis. He's a surgeon. There are only two surgeons of his caliber in the city of Homs. He's a chest surgeon. 
He said, I have to leave. I said, why now? I mean, now it's the situation that you have to stay. He said, I have a family of, with five children. I'm worried about their safety, and I cannot sustain my, my life. Uh, I'm dependent on the local NGOs to pay for me because the healthcare system has been disseminated in Syria, mm -hmm. and also the economy is not working. So people are not able to pay for uh, the physician's uh, visit. So now he decided to leave, and of course, if he left, that means other uh, people who are in need for his services will not be able to have surgeries. The worst thing to happen for you in Syria, in the city of Homs or Dara or Damascus, if you have a heart attack or, you, or for a woman to have a delivery in the middle of the night. Because first of all, it's not safe to go to the hospital. And if you are lucky to go to a hospital, you will not find a physician. Uh, in the city of Aleppo, I've seen medical students, first year medical students who are working as surgeon because there's only 75 physicians in the city of Aleppo serving 3 million population. I've seen an interior designer who is working in the emergency room as a medic, as a nurse, because there are no nurses. So the worst thing for you if you are a patient in Syria is to get sick in the middle of the night. Many people, unfortunately, are dying. And of course, these are not among the 80,000 or so people who are killed. Um, many patients who are on dialysis, they're not able to get dialysis because they're not able to get access to the dialysis unit and they're not able to pay for it. I'm going to end my briefing with the, with the story of Dr. Abdelaziz, who I mentioned, that he left his, his, his post. And I told him, you know, what, what, why are you doing what you're doing? I mean, you, you can still continue to work in the Aleppo University, and uh, it's safer for you. Uh, the Aleppo University is in the other side. And actually, this term now, you hear it more in, in Syria, the other side, because every city has the side of the opposition and the other side, which is under the control of the government. He said, look, you know, if I left my post, um, no one will take uh, care of the um, uh, hospitals in, in this area of the city. And uh, I know that if I caught by the uh, government forces, I will be executed right away. Um, but I believe that this is my duty. And uh, because of this uh, person, because of these heroes in Syria, I think we have to support uh, uh, the medical community in Syria. There's a lot of things that can be done. First of all, we have to have the, the uh, will uh, political will to end the crisis because without ending the crisis the situation will continue to deteriorate uh, right now is a disastrous already but i think we have to end the crisis uh, and uh, secondly we have to make sure that uh, there is a safe um, uh, transport of uh, humanitarian assistance cross-border from turkey and jordan to many of the areas in city that are in need uh, and we're talking here about uh, operations that uh, the local NGOs and Syrian American Medical Society and others cannot do it on their own. These are uh, operations that requires um, countries and the United Nations to do it, but right now it's being done by individuals and organizations. So there should be an international uh, community uh, operations to uh, cross-border humanitarian assistance so we can help uh, these physicians. Supporting the physicians in Syria financially so they can stay in Syria because right now they are depleted from their savings. 50% of the physicians have already left. Uh, and I've mentioned some of the examples of what's happening in Syria uh, because of the shortage of physicians. These are some of the things which I uh, believe that the international community and the US government has to push for. Of course, ultimately, no fly zone would be very helpful. I know that this is a long shot, but uh, this is something that everyone is asking for when you go into Syria. I would like to stop on this, and maybe we can uh, address some of the other issues during the... Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salou. Uh, Stephen Cornish, MSF. Thank you very much for having me here today. Um, certainly, the, the thematic that we're covering, unfortunately, is becoming all too common in a number of conflict areas where, where our organization and others work in this lack of respect for uh, medical facilities, lack of respect for civilians, and lack of respect for humanitarian assistance. Um, I won't go into great detail, perhaps, on, on, on the targeting on both sides that's happening, given the, the introduction and, and giving the excellent presentation. But certainly, I think the, the, the systematization of the attacks was probably much more at the beginning of this conflict. Um, and it certainly served its purpose. It, it, it created the flight of, of uh, many medical personnel. Uh, it destroyed large numbers of, of uh, hospitals. And, and interrupted public health care in, in a very significant way. I think since then we've seen uh, through the works of, of SAMS, through the works of, of other organizations, uh, that the surgery, surgery capacity has been um, uh, re restocked, if you like, 
uh, but in a way that's often underground, often semi-clandestine, uh, that uh, has a lot of limitations uh, to it, and which unfortunately has also been used uh, by both sides in the conflict. There's been an appropriation of, of medical spaces. Uh, there's been a cannibalization of existing medical structures in order to supply those, uh, those outposts. And, uh, and a lot of them have been um, primarily serving combatants uh, at the expense of civilian care. And so there, there are issues on both sides that, that truly need to be addressed. And, uh, and I think that need, need addressing and, and need our attention and certainly need our government's attention. The collapse of the, of the public health system has had a number of effects, some already mentioned, but certainly anyone suffering from a chronic disease has had their, their treatment interrupted, whether it be uh, diabetes, whether it be cancer, high blood pressure. Um, we've witnessed uh, many, many people, and we call them the si silent casualties of this war. We like to talk about the 70,000 dead and the hundreds of thousands injured, uh, but there are so many more that are not in the spotlight. They can't be referred outside of the country because it's not considered emergency, but the facilities to follow them up don't exist anymore. And so what, what you see is a, is a slow, steady death of people that could be treated. Um, in our own, one of our own centers, we had a, a man arrive with two feet completely necrophied, uh, needed an amputation. But if we were to have amputated uh, those feet, the disease might have spread to the patients that were on our burn unit and the patients that, uh, that we were treating for war wounded uh, uh, issues. And so we couldn't give him that treatment, and we also couldn't send him away. And you know that in a few weeks, he would become an emergency patient. Uh, displaced people, I saw uh, folks who had cancer, their chemotherapy was interrupted, uh, and all they can do is have palliative uh, medicines and slowly, day by day, die. Uh, the interruption on the public health system is, is very worrying. There's been a lack of vaccination since the beginning of this conflict. And when we're talking about these uh, inhospitable conditions within which people are living, uh, with the lack of uh, water, with the lack of electricity. <coughs> you have, in many areas, numbers of families in the same apartments or in, in fairly difficult conditions in, in makeshift camps. Uh, and that facilitates the, the uh, spread of disease. We've seen a, a, a comeback of measles. Measles had been uh, eradicated in Syria, and we're now uh, launching uh, measles vaccinations in many areas, which we'll return to later because maybe it is one of those, what can be done? It might be mm -hmm. the, the seeds of of how to work on both sides and how to help to restore uh, a little bit of humanitarian space. Uh, part of the underground problem also makes it difficult for folks who are wounded to seek care. Um, they either don't know where a, uh, a facility is or the facility is being uh, truly kept for combatants and so uh, is, is overwhelmed with the load of combatants they have and won't, won't accept uh, to care for civilians. And so we've had a number of people uh, who have either been evacuated in extremis on a circuitous route in the back of taxis, losing blood, some losing their lives, going several hours away uh, to seek treatment. And part of that is because they may not know where the treatment is, part is because they might be excluded, but part comes back to this initial targeting and the fact that some of them are fearful of seeking uh, medical care in, a, in an established facility, or they're being prevented from crossing either uh, a front line or even just crossing from one territory to another so instead of going to a, a facility that's equipped and nearby, uh, some that our uh, organization has worked with, some that Sam has worked with, uh, they will flee in the opposite direction, often traveling two, three, four hours by car, uh, and, then, and then sadly, uh, quite often too late. Um, maternity was touched on very briefly, but I'd like to, to return to that because in, in, C in Syria, um, C-sections were a very common practice. And as an anyone, uh, here who's had one or knows about it, once you've had one or two, you generally have to have a follow-up C-section on, on your next pregnancy. And uh, trying to find maternity care is, is very, very difficult. There are very few places that, that, will, uh, that will take uh, women that are pregnant, and generally they'll take those that are not complicated. So if you have a complicated pregnancy, uh, you're at very great difficulty. We had one woman who traveled for four days, went to eight different structures uh, before she found our clinic. She was uh, pregnant with twins, and thankfully they, they're both uh, dropping little healthy babies now. Uh, but very many more don't have that, uh, that facility. And, uh, and so there is a lot that needs to be done on, on uh, that side of things. Remaining obstacles to care, there, there are a number. Uh, not only the initial insecurity and the fact that, unlike some conflicts where you have one or two front lines, here you have a number of different front lines, 
and pockets of violence that emanate from different military structures, military bases, and also sometimes between opposition groups themselves. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to, uh, to know where <coughs> checkpoints are, it makes it very difficult to be able to arrange, uh, to have free passage for medical assistance and for humanitarian assistance. Uh, basically the groundwork changes almost day by day, and so it's very difficult to, to establish a, a permanent uh, security and a permanent uh, passage. <coughs> There's also great suspicion uh, for uh, in the opposition areas this, and in the government areas, great suspicion of, of foreigners and of those seeking to help. Uh, and so that also pushes the aid even farther underground and makes it even more difficult for, for uh, organizations to, to come and help on the ground. One, one is struck with, um, by the absolute absence of most of the well-known organizations that normally uh, mm -hmm. work in these, in these uh, areas, not only inside Syria where it's very difficult, but also in the surrounding uh, refugee camps where uh, those governments are doing the best they can with very hard uh, level of refugees uh, but they're treating it as a regular situation that's within their control. And sadly, they're not living up to the, the uh, quality of care that's, that's stipulated. <coughs> and I think our governments need to assist the host countries to really be able to better cope with this, allowing more organizations in. Uh, our governments also need to back up the, the financial promises they've made uh, and scale them up because the promises made were when there were 750,000 refugees. We now have 1.5 million, and as we heard today, the prognostics are that that number will double by the end of the year. And we've always been several months behind the humanitarian situation. Uh, we were behind last winter. We were behind now this summer. Coming into the summer, uh, our organization is stepping in to chlorinate water in, in uh, IDP camps, uh, where there are open sewers, where there are uh, overcrowding, <coughs> where even uh, food and, and shelter is, is being stretched by the new arrivals. And if something isn't done, we'll end up with infectious disease and outbreaks this summer. Uh, but the same can be said then when we know already that there are, are going to be 1.5 million more people coming, uh, that those who are already in shelters are in very substandard shelters. They sleep on the mud sometimes with just a blanket between them and the ground. Uh, they need to be by now in, in winterized tents. And those are not being bought. They're not being prepositioned. The camps are not being built. So if we don't prepare now for next winter, uh, we're going to have a huge humanitarian disaster on our hands. Um, crossing front lines was mentioned, and I think that's something that we share uh, with, our, with our colleagues from the ICRC who are here. Um, they, they have, uh, sadly, with the, with the Red Crescent, lost several uh, of their members who are either evacuating uh, wounded or trying to go across front lines. This is something that we can't uh, only do ourselves. We certainly have to put more effort on explaining to all parties to the conflict that medical aid and passage has to be able to go across front lines. Um, and so that's something we should return to. Um, and in the opposition areas, there are also, with the splintering of groups uh, and this, um, this real uh, uh, fear of, of the other, uh, a number of emerging risks that are becoming very difficult uh, to tackle. I'll wrap up now with the, with the what can be done. Um, we have touched on the, the overwhelming need. Uh, this is going to affect healthcare clearly for years to come. And it will be a humanitarian situation for years to come. Uh, the UN is said that something like a, a million dwellings have been destroyed. So even if the war were, were to miraculously wrap up tomorrow, uh, there'll still be this very large population uh, needing humanitarian and medical assistance for, for the time to come. Um, the cross-border activity that, that we're able to do in northern Syria, we have three hospitals, we're supporting over 50 others. Uh, sadly, we're unable to work through Damascus, but there we're working with networks of doctors and sending supplies, it's not good enough but it's something, and also bringing doctors out to train them up. Uh, we're training in mass casualty, uh, training in, in anesthesia, training um, small health posts just in kind of combat first aid to be able to stop bleeding, get breathing, and help people uh, be stabilized on their, on their transfer out. And I think that's something that definitely can be increased by a number of parties and at a very little expense. Uh, but with the assistance that is being sent, uh, some of it uh, rather quietly, I think it's very important that we ensure that all of those medical structures uh, will also be serving civilian needs. Um, I visited several uh, that didn't have a space for women patients, didn't have bathrooms for women patients, and were, were designed and facilitating only those who were uh, directly affected by the combat amongst the ranks of those who were running them. And I think that's something that we need to really ensure that the assistance that, uh, that's being sent, not only through the cross-border that needs to, to be brought up, uh, but also on the Damascus side where there are limits to 
how far along uh, the chain of, uh, of relief systems can be followed. And in some cases, uh, aid is, 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 has to be passed over uh, before it gets to its final destination, and then you don't know where it's going to end up. And certainly, there needs to be much more effort made with Damascus to allow uh, regular cross-front lines, not just uh, uh, cross-front line visits now and again. A scale-up is possible. Uh, we've, I've, I've touched on it briefly. It was 1.4, I think, uh, billion promised in January by some 30 countries or 60 countries. Only about a third of that has been delivered. And since then, the scale of the suffering and the need has gone up threefold. So there's something that's, that's wrong in this equation. It's as if the political paralysis has somehow paralyzed also our humanitarian response. And that certainly, these two issues have to be delinked. We can't hold up the humanitarian response and the life-saving needs now. So there is more that we can do uh, with the surrounding countries, with the parties to the conflict, uh, and ourselves. And I'll just uh, finish on, on looking inward also. I think our own organizations have to try harder. Uh, it is difficult to, to, to risk to cross front lines. It's difficult to risk to work with all parties to a conflict. Um, our own ability to continue working in Syria, Syria depends on it. If we're not able to help all parties to a conflict um, and to respond according to the needs, uh, that's what impartiality means. So if there's a million on one side and 100,000 on the other, we have to ensure that our, our assistance as an international community is also delivered that way. And that's not always the case uh, as, we, as we are today. Finally, measles, which is a, is a, is a, a horrible challenge, uh, might also present uh, the beginnings of, of an opportunity. Uh, because uh, while it might be difficult for us today, even in the north, there are enclaved areas there are some towns that uh, were handed over by the government to forces that are, are, have a similar ideology or are, are considered friends. Um, and we've had trouble entering those areas. Uh, on my last visit, uh, um, we were able to enter one of these areas and we saw uh, something that goes less reported. And that was, um, uh, there was a big battle in, in Aleppo in, in, in uh, Sheikh Mansour area. This is a Kurdish area. So th a lot of the indiscriminate fighting in that area uh, could be equally shared by both sides. Uh, the victims fled to, to an area that, uh, that was under Kurdish control, uh, where there was a hospital structure, uh, where they were attempting to deal with the IDPs, uh, having a very difficult time of it. Our organization has since uh, supported those structures, the medical structures that had, that had uh, been set up, and supported the IDPs. And I think it's very important that, that we all make these efforts to ensure that we're not only helping the pockets that are easiest or the pockets that uh, that we agree with, but uh, all pockets and, and all areas of need. And just to, to, to stop on measles, I think uh, we've seen elsewhere, even in the, in the most difficult times in, in Afghanistan, under the Taliban, uh, we were able to make uh, days of tranquility for polio. And I think it might be maybe the starting way that we can start, uh, even in the opposition areas, to work on both sides of uh, the conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dorothy Shea. Thank you. And I just want to say it's an honor to serve on this panel uh, with the fellow panelists who have shown personal commitment to helping those in need in this crisis, sometimes at great risk to themselves, as we were just hearing. Um, so I'm going to, uh, coming from the State Department, I am speaking from prepared remarks, so forgive me, but that is kind of the, the price of admission uh, as a government official. But um, hopefully in the q and I'll be able to speak a little more extemporaneously uh, if you want to delve more deeply into some of these. What I'd like to do is review some of the aspects of the severity of the, the health care attacks. And then uh, say a word about the humanitarian agencies that the United States government and others are supporting as they heroically continue to provide assistance. And then talk a, a little more about this funding situation uh, that Steve just raised and conclude with some thoughts about the long term. Mm. So I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it, that two years of conflict in Syria have taken an incredibly severe toll on the healthcare system. I won't regurgitate the grim statistics that shape our work in this area, but we have to be reminded every day of the tragic toll of civilian deaths, huge refugee flows, which I deal with personally every day, and the massive displacements inside Syria, often multiple times as the fighting shifts uh, on a daily basis. Uh, hospitals, clinics, doctors, medical staff are all being directly and violently targeted. Um, and again, other panelists have, have talked about the statistics and they're grim and they're shocking. 
Um, I've seen reports that 469 medical workers have been imprisoned. I wouldn't be surprised if it's higher. And then, of course, fearing for their safety, thousands of healthcare providers have fled. And, and who can blame them? I mean, I, I, uh, I understand this, uh, this crisis of conscience that this doctor that Dr. Sahul talked about had in terms of fearing for his family's safety. But I want to be clear, the United States government strongly condemns these deliberate attacks. Patients must not be prevented from seeking care. Healthcare professionals must not be impeded from providing it. And medical facilities and transport must not be targeted, period. Medical care providers who remain in Syria <coughs> face challenges in caring for the sick and wounded in facilities that lack fuel and electricity and equipment. We've heard about that. But against this backdrop, the heroic work of life saving continues. Many organizations work tirelessly under extremely dangerous conditions to provide health and other basic services. And I'm proud that the United States government is supporting their work. So I'd like to name a few. Uh, since the beginning of the conflict, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent's volunteers have been providing medical services at great personal risk. In an environment where battle lines are constantly shifting, the volunteers have been working to reach communities in both government and opposition held areas. And I take the point that we need to do more in opposition controlled areas, and they're trying to, uh, but it's, it is difficult. 18 of them have been killed while in service. The International Committee of the Red Cross is providing medical supplies, water, food. Uh, ICRC is providing access to clean drinking water to at least 10 million people, and I've read that the clean drinking water uh, uh, stocks have decreased in availability by about two-thirds since the conflict began. We also support the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees, UNRWA, which provides health, education, and social services to 525,000 Palestinian refugees, 235,000 of which <coughs> have been displaced by the conflict. UNRWA <coughs> reports that its health clinics have seen a significant decline in consultations. Uh, so this just illustrates how inaccessible their clinics are as well, uh, fitting that uh, phenomenon that you all discussed. Six UNRWA staff members have died and 13 are missing. There are numerous other organizations. The United Nations Population Fund, which has delivered ambulances, ventilators, other medical equipment. UNFPA and other partners are also responding to gender-based violence both in Syria and neighboring countries. The United Nations Children's Fund deserves our support. They've been very instrumental in trying to maintain access both to education for children affected by the conflict, but also basic you know, water, sanitation, and hygiene. Uh, I want to give a shout out to our colleagues from USAID who are supporting UNICEF as well because of the measles outbreak that we heard about earlier. Uh, We've seen these refugee in, in the refugee populations as well in Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. So the U.S. government has funded the vaccinations of nearly one million children inside Syria. And of course, a huge partner for us in PRM at the State Department is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. They were presidents present in Syria long before the conflict, largely supporting the Iraqi refugee population. Uh, and so what they did was they expanded and opened up their services to help meet the needs of displaced Syrians. And of course, in neighboring countries, UNHCR is coordinating the full range of services for refugees, including uh, basic health care. Of course, uh, I take the point, too, that there's room for improvement there. Um, and I just want to note that countless NGOs, local NGOs, international NGOs, are also playing a vital role, including those represented on this panel. The governments and civil society organizations of neighboring countries have played a very important role in providing health to refugees, even as the refugee influx has strained national healthcare systems and local economies. We commend their generosity and respect for humanitarian principles. <coughs> to date, mortality and malnutrition rates in the refugee camps are low. The chronic disease burden is primarily consisting of diabetes, cardiovascular, and lung disease. Given the trauma that many refugees have experienced, mental health and psychosocial services are also extremely important. Infectious diseases remain a concern, TB, 
uh, especially for Syrians whose treatment was interrupted by the conflict. And the desert conditions in Jordan and Iraq can be pretty harsh, invoking acute respiratory infections. And uh, as Dr. Safoul said, some cases of leishmaniasis. A quick word on the funding front. Uh, of the $1.6 billion requested in the UN appeals, donors have provided nearly at 816 million, so about 51%. I don't think that number accounts for the 100 million that the United States announced this week, though. There's a lag time in the UN's uh, tracking system. Uh, and Secretary Kerry did announce an additional contribution, which we can talk about more. So we are grateful for the support from Congress as we make these contributions, both for the UN system, but also they support NGOs that are working outside the UN system doing the kind of cross-border assistance we talked about <coughs> earlier. And we do coordinate that with the opposition's uh, assistance coordination unit. Looking forward, uh, I share the view that even if a political solution were secured tomorrow, the humanitarian needs would persist long into the future. So we're really trying to work with humanitarian organizations now to work with and in coordination with uh, those who will be playing a longer term role in Syria's economic development and reconstruction. And I just want to throw out one example of how this could play out in the health sector. Uh, the United States has asked WHO to engage ministries of health in neighboring countries to allow Syrian healthcare providers who can prove their credentials to support humanitarian health operations. So this could be win-win in providing surge capacity uh, but also allowing them to contribute to the response effort and keeping their skills sharp until such time as they can return and help rebuild the Syrian healthcare system. This crisis is severe. Some have characterized it as a catastrophe, understandably. And so we do need to be in it for the long haul. The United States government is, and we remain committed to promoting access to health and other basic services in Syria and neighboring countries as long as this emergency lasts. Thanks, Dorothy. Len Rubenstein, you've been very patient. Well, I'll try to uh, be quick uh, in, and so we can get the conversation going. But I do want to thank Steve for, and CSIS for having this event. This issue of targeted attacks simply does not get enough attention. And I want to briefly, very briefly, review four points. One, what's the context of these attacks in terms of what's happened in the world over the last 20 years? Two, what do we understand, if anything, about what is motivating the attacks? Three, what can we do, and what is the long-term prospect, and how do we meet, meet the needs? If you look around the world in conflicts in, in, in um, Burma, in Colombia, in Afghanistan, in Kosovo, in Chechnya, in Sri Lanka, the list goes on, in Gaza, in the West Bank, there have been specific, deliberate attacks on healthcare services, that is ambulance and hospitals and doctors and nurses and patients. But nothing has quite reached this scale. And just if I could take two examples of what previously had been the worst, in my view. One was in Kosovo, there was a major report, and Ron Walden here today who did that report. Uh, the Serb forces just burned 100 clinics, uh, uh, probably 25 doctors were arrested and tortured, eight were put on trial for providing uh, health care to a terrorist. It's pretty serious. In Chechnya, probably 30 to 40 hospitals were bombed or shelled. But then you compare that to Syria and the scale is completely different. When we talk about a third of the hospitals in the whole country not functioning because they were attacked, when you talk about 250 health workers killed. And just interestingly, not interestingly, but importantly, the Violence Documentation Center there, which has been keeping track of uh, health workers who were killed, reported in March that 120 doctors had been killed. Their last report this month, 130. So that's 10 in the four to six weeks since their last report. There's been nothing like this that we're aware of in, in the past, where the number of murders of of health workers has been at this scale. And the, someone mentioned that four to 500 uh, doctors and other health workers in prison or jailed is also, a, to my mind, unprecedented. So that's, we have to understand that scale, and that's why it's so important that we take some action. 
Why is this happening? Well, we're not sure exactly why it's happening, but I want to share one um, notion that comes out of some of the really excellent documentation work. I mentioned the, uh, the Violence Documentation Project, the Independent Commission, the UN established for Syria has done remarkably good work. Human Rights Watch has done excellent documentation. And what you find is very explicit statements that providing health care to an enemy is wrong and punishable and worthy of arrest, torture, or murder. It's not called murder, it's called a legitimate response because health care has become an enemy act. It's like weapons transport. That's how health care is settled. There's a very poignant story in one of the UN Independent Commission reports where there's a dialogue that a doctor reported where the, the Syrian soldier said, why are you providing health care to the opposition? Why are you providing medicine to these people? It's as though the norm that has been around for 150 years does not exist anymore. That health care to the enemy is, an, is a hostile act. And the problem actually goes deeper than Syria because we've seen this before. We saw that in Kosovo. We saw that in Chechnya. We've seen that elsewhere. But it's becoming more of an infringement of the norm in this age of anti-terrorism. Even in, under U.S. law, medical care to a, terror, to, to a terrorist is a violation of U.S. law. So, and this is happening around the world. So we have, we have some kind of uh, norm issues that tie into the brutality of the government uh, in Syria, and that might also help explain why the opposition has also committed these kinds of of um, act. And the impact is not just on the people. And it's not even a long, just a long-term impact. Patients are terrified to go for health care. And providers have been reported to refuse health care to certain people out of fear. And this is harder to document. But that is something we need to pay attention to. So when we look at why this is happening, we have to go deeper than the fact that the government pays no attention to the norms of humanitarian law. So what do we do? I think what Dorothy did today is a terrific start. We have to start by condemning this, and it has to be condemned by governments at the diplomatic level to start with. And I'm really quite delighted that the US government is now on record. And of course, we'd like to see it at higher levels. We'd like to see the President and the Secretary of State talk to this as well. Now, we know condemnation may make no difference. It may not change behavior. But we also know that if you can recast health in the way it should be as somehow sacrosanct, there are pressures that can develop. And certainly not condemning is a guarantee that it will continue. So condemnation sounds weak. It's not like a no-fly zone, but it is a place to start. And it's important because it relates to my other point about restoration of values. We've got to reaffirm those values globally. And that's also why it's important to make a demand, hopeless as it may, as it may, see, it may seem, for accountability through referral to the International Criminal Court. We know all the problems at the Security Council that Russia and China are objecting and have objected and probably <coughs> will object to any action by the Security Council. But there is value in having a campaign to make the case. That silence on prosecution, silence on accountability is a guarantee of no accountability. And that brings us to those sitting in the room, whoever we are, uh, who care about this issue. This has to become more of a broad-based public issue. And I'm really happy to report that in the last couple of years, campaigns have started. The ICRC has developed its already ever more visible healthcare and danger campaign. I know MSF is about to launch its campaign. And there's an NGO campaign called the Safeguard Health and Conflict Coalition, which is designed to engage UN agencies and government in a more robust response. So there are things that can be done to affect the short term and, and the long term. Finally, on the reconstruction, uh, as, as Stephen pointed out and others, uh, so uh, Mohammed pointed out, 
the need for humanitarian action in Syria is going to go on for a long time. But it's not just humanitarian action. We have to start planning now for health reconstruction. And there's nothing more important in terms of what's happened for future health <coughs> reconstruction than the human resources. Because we've heard how they've fled, and we know those who have, have remained are traumatized. And not only that, those who are, have remained are going to be subject to reprisals, or may be subject to reprisals, even when some kind of peace agreement came. We saw this in Kosovo. Reprisals after the peace agreement were pervasive. And if we don't think about this now, for the medical community, there's going to be trouble. And finally, for the people who have lived through this, they're going to need support in terms of their own conduct. What is medical ethics after you've been targeted? So w this is a kind of issue that all the countries, including our own government in the United States, need to take account of and start thinking about right now. So I'll stop there so we can start the conversation. Thank you. Um, excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> um, you know, in listening to this, um, one proposition that kind of comes forward is that perhaps the situation on the ground is reaching a scale in which some of the calculations within the region and more globally may change. And but what I mean by that is if the staggering export of refugees into the surrounding region is going to threaten uh, several states in terms of their stability, does that give us an opportunity to re-engage in a targeted way the Russians in particular around the whole question of cross-border. Um, we know that there's been an inability to move anything in the Security Council in a serious fashion because of that opposition. We know that Assad's uh, intransigence uh, on both the cross-line and cross-border and the continuing targeting is rooted in a certain amount of confidence that this is working for his advantage. And so far, that tragic formula has held. So is this changing? Are we in a moment now? And I'd, I'd like to come to Sahir to comment on this. Are we coming at a moment where there can be a different kind of conversation in which the, the magnitude of human suffering plus the regional security threat equates into a different kind of set of pressures upon the Russians and others vis-a-vis -vis this particular crisis that might begin to unlock some of these problems. Because the intransigence, the, the deliberate systematic targeting, the intransigence on the cross-line, cross-border stuff has created this locked box in which this has been possible. Sahar, can you talk? I hope so, uh, although um, foreign policy, and I'm not uh, expert in foreign policy is not based on the humanitarian issues as everyone is aware and what drives foreign policy is national interest uh, I'm not aware that the Russians uh, are that uh, concerned about the suffering in Syria um, one of my friends who is a physician who studied in Russia reminded me with the Russian saying that um, killing one physician is more important than killing 100 soldiers um, and I think what Len has mentioned about what happened in Chechnya was happened by the same Russian government that is supporting Assad at this point. But I think there is an opening right now with the, what's happening between um, uh, regarding the conference uh, that is being held uh, at the end of this month, hopefully. Uh, and uh, if we can pressure or um, convince the Russians to uh, pressure the Syrian government and Assad to stop the attacks, at least on the hospitals and the healthcare system, that may be um, uh, an option. We haven't done that before. Uh, we directed our policy toward something more grandiose. But maybe we can just focus on the humanitarian issues, uh, asking the Russians to help us, pressuring them uh, to, uh, to stop. Because Russia is the only country and Iran that can influence the Syrian government at this point. Um, I am hopeful, uh, hopefully, with this uh, conference that will be happening at the end of this month. Dorothy, what do you see as the diplomatic prospects? I mean, we had the King of Jordan here last week pleading his case. He sees an avalanche coming his way. He's already fully in it. What, what does this mean? Well, the neighbors are very concerned about the destabilizing effect of these large... Is your mic on? Can you hear me? Can you hear? You know what? I think I never turned the phone. <laughs> 
So the neighbors are really concerned about the potentially destabilizing effect of these massive refugee flows. Um, and to the extent possible, if it is possible to, to meet uh, the humanitarian needs of those who don't have a, 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 a flight risk in terms of needing to flee for their lives, they wonder whether it's possible to meet some of these humanitarian needs inside Syria. Uh, that requires you know, to the degree it's possible, ramping up in a massive way the traditional humanitarian assistance uh, reach, uh, the non-traditional, which is cross-border, and sort of the hybrid, which is cross-line, crossing conflict lines, <coughs> but in a sanctioned way. Now, the way the government is operating with, cro with respect to cross-line is at a time when needs are increasing, they are ramping up the bureaucratic requirements to do cross-line assistance. Uh, the UN has to provide 72 hours advance notice, get two signatures from two different ministers. Um, they have you know, all kinds of bureaucratic obstacles. Uh, I heard last week from the emergency director from WHO that they were prevented from including surgical supplies in a cross-line convoy that was going to Aleppo. So if that's what cross-line is, then we're, we're still not going to be satisfied. Um, at the same time, cross-border isn't going to be the silver bullet right. because you have places like Homs and uh, uh, Reef Damascus that are not well positioned to take advantage right. of, of that kind of operation. Stephen, did you have any thoughts on the, on the question well, around diplomatic engagement? Yeah, I mean, we yeah. had the Belgian statement in February, right? We had 49 countries sign on to a fairly strong statement. You could look back on February and say that's had zero impact uh, operationally or politically. It was a, you know, it was a well-intentioned statement. But the, uh, and we, you know, the Security Council passed a resolution calling for cross-border in southern Sudan. Uh, there hasn't been a single impact in southern Kordofan. I mean, you can look at a multitude of precedents or actions. I'm raising the question of whether the game is shifting in a way that you might say, okay, run at this particular problem in a specific way now. Yeah, th three things. The first is, uh, I, I think, on the Security Council, that is the place to be pushing strong for the respect of international humanitarian law. And it should be on. It is on, so it's whoever. Um, it's, it, that is the place to push for, for respect on both sides. And I think it, it's probably unhelpful if, if, um, if our rhetoric is stronger on one side than the other. So if, if, we, if we truly look at, at enough of the incidences that are occurring on the opposition side, we've, we've had uh, different opposition groups raise their flags on top of medical facilities. Uh, there has been um, also bases put very close to certain hospitals that ended up being targeted. So if we come at this with a much more balanced approach, uh, I think that might be the first thing that people could agree on um, and actually start something. I and mean, then that goes to Len's point. Whether it, whether it then becomes fully efficient and changes everything or not, uh, it's the first step. And that first step needs to be taken. And I'm not sure that that, that step has been taken as, as seriously as it, as it could be. Um, uh, on the neighboring countries, I, I, I'm um, almost at a loss. I published an op-ed th this, uh, this week on, on Monday. The, the title was, We Are Failing the Syrian People. Uh, the, the idea that, that, that we're ramping up, that we're doing all these things, there are a number of very well-recognized uh, humanitarian organizations and development organizations that cannot get registered in Turkey, cannot get registered in Lebanon, that are having visa issues, registration issues. Mm -hmm. uh, these are countries we can have a discussion with. Uh, those are also other countries in the, in the region, uh, Iraq and Jordan. They're not as, as comfortable with, uh, with folks working cross-border. There's also a discussion to be had. And there are other ways of, of uh, funding organizations to do this work. And that work can be done. So the first thing is, if we truly burden share and truly help the surrounding countries and assistance according to need, in, in Lebanon, 50% of the refugees don't have access to health care. In Lebanon, in, in the Beka Valley, they have to go to one central processing point to get a refugee card. And that 
takes several weeks. You've got to take your whole family by taxi. Where are you supposed to get this money or help? Then you wait four months to be registered. In Jordan, you have online registration and tons of different little kiosks of the UNHCR. So there's a real problem also about how we're looking at responding. Mm -hmm. There's less money going to Lebanon, and we say, because there aren't camps. That actually makes it more difficult to help people. And they need camps. They're never going to be ready for the winter without camps. We need to put technical assistance in in order to make sure that those camps will be built. But if we work strongly with those governments to really burden share, to really help on technical experience, and to, to help them get into an emergency standpoint on this so that they allow enough humanitarian actors on the ground, then we can already deal to begin with, with their own issues about destabilization because of the refugee load. If we don't, you risk that those borders are going to be closed and refugees won't be able to flee. So if we do that first, that's one. And second, then we encourage them on the cross-border. You don't need uh, the Russians. Uh, you don't need the Chinese. You don't need anyone else to allow you or not allow you to do cross-border. You only need uh, the, the state that's in the country that, that you're uh, in. Uh, to at least either facilitate or turn a fairly good blind eye. And uh, we are able now, not only our humanitarian organization, trade is working uh, like nobody's business in Syria. They are exporting cotton across the border in one direction, exporting uh, olive oil, um, soap from another. There, there are lineups of trucks from some borders going in and out. And, and at the same time, we, we watch a film that says that you can only bring these little kits kind of Maybe we've, we've kind of done it ourselves with this clandestine word of how we're working and how we're getting across. Some of the points are very small, very underground, very difficult. But there are larger points where you can drive trucks of relief supplies in. So maybe what we need to be doing is, is to bring trucks of relief supplies to, to the uh, front line in Aleppo and, and make a stand there as far as making uh, cross front line assistance. Uh, work can be done on, on both cross border and, and cross front line. But we are nowhere near meeting the overwhelming needs that are on the ground. We know what they are. It is, it, it is, we're, we're heartfelt that assistance is now coming in. There was 300 million, I think, from the Qataris, the 100 million from Kuwait, from Ka Kuwait sorry, the 100 million from the US. It's very needed, very appreciated. But we have to remember the numbers that the UN put out, this 1.4, was when there were 750,000 people on the books. They now have twice that many refugees plus this how many million more displaced that they want to service inside. We're not meeting all of those needs. And in some respects, some of our own publicity perhaps is not terribly helpful because if we talk about bringing water to 10 million or the WFP talks about feeding 2.5 million, we, we, we think they're doing that every day. Those shipments are, are, are handed over at a certain place and then we hope that they get places. I was in Aleppo in neighborhoods uh, with no water, no electricity, folks struggling to get by with the added cost that, uh, that war brings, high inflation. Uh, some of them are, are, are starting to displace because they can't afford just to feed their family, not that they're actually under the bombs. And there are whole neighborhoods that have not seen any humanitarian assistance from anyone. So we really need to shake ourselves up a little bit. Somehow, uh, so much work and, and very good work is being done on the political side. Uh, people are trying, and there are lots of obstacles, but there are more solutions also, and there's more that we can do, and more that we can do now and must do. Sahir, you, ran, you referenced an interesting fact that you observed that hospitals in Aleppo are putting up uh, tense facilities with respect to chemical threats. This week's D uh, Dexter Filkins piece came out in The New Yorker, which quoted a number of very, very authoritative folks talking about the re reminding us of the reality that uh, this is a country that made a very, over several decades, made a major investment in chemical weapons across distributed sites and has enormous capacity. It's a very difficult thing to disable and, and, it's, and we're beginning to see the suggestion that this is being used in a deliberate way. Very ambiguous and very, and, and, and a continued debate around this. When you ask folks who are the professionals in this area and say, well, what do you do in this setting? It comes down to a couple of basic things, right? It's monitors, it's gas masks, it's decontamination capacities. Is it realistic to think that you can, you can in a discreet way, begin to be supplying some of these things to those hospitals in both opposition, well, largely in opposition areas, that where this threat may be most concentrated? Do you have any thoughts on that? 
We did. I mean, what uh, we did that uh, last time we went to uh, Aleppo, I took with me actually face uh, mm -hmm. gas masks. Uh, I took about 120 of them, uh, and because what I discovered uh, when had we had the tour, and it looks like the hospitals are stocking uh, with supplies uh, for uh, another chemical weapon. They are using the regular mask that we use uh, for common cold and viral mm -hmm. infection. They are using the same gowns that we use uh, if patients has bacterial infection. And of course, these are not effective when you have a chemical weapon attack. So what we did in this last uh, training course that we trained uh, some of the physicians who came from Aleppo on what to do when you have a chemical uh, exposure, uh, decontamination using the antidote, monitoring the patients, uh, make sh making sure that the personnel who are treating the patients are not exposed by using the proper uh, chemical gear. Uh, and I think there is a lot of this that can be done to help some hospitals in certain hot areas that people know that probably it will be targeted in the, f in, in the future, in the near future. Whether it's Aleppo area or Idlib or Homs or Damascus, and these are the areas which we had reported the previous chemical weapon uh, exposure. Um, so protective gear for the physicians and the first responders, um, uh, helping them in training, because this is not something that uh, the medical community deals with on a daily basis, uh, providing them with the antidote, with the atropine ampules. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we purchased 20,000 atropine ampules in Turkey, and we gave it to the local Aleppo Medical Council. They can use it in Aleppo, and also in the city of Afrin that had some of the patients. We did the same in Damascus. It's very cheap, actually, to purchase them, uh, but some, uh, right now, the market inside Syria, you, you don't, uh, there is a shortage of atrophy. So I think this is something else that we can do. Thank you. Can I ask, I'm going to come to um, Lynn in a, just a moment, but can I ask you, on this question around measles and outbreaks and whether there's a, a space now for a quiet dialogue across lines between government and opposition authorities about a kind of humanita a, a tacit humanitarian cooperation in order to permit resumption of campaign of immunization campaigns or other th other measures depending on whether we're talking about measles or something else what do you think the realistic prospects are and how would you go about encouraging this in your view uh, it, it's happening at the individual level uh, when uh, i witnessed in aleppo for example that the medical council are communicating with the uh, other uh, medical uh, entities on the other side, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. for dialysis patients. So mm -hmm. I witnessed that myself, that we went to a city called Al Bab, where you have one hospital that is under the regime, and the rest of the Bab is under the uh, opposition. And we visit this uh, straight of the art hospital that has a very functioning di dialysis unit that is not functioning to the full capacity. So Dr. Abdul Aziz, who was with me, he was trying to negotiate with that administrator mm -hmm. And why don't you take some of our patients' load? And it looks like the administrator accepted that. So these type of collaborations are happening. We need to encourage them. Uh, we need to make sure that, uh, the, the, to be aware that they're happening. Um, at, between the government and the opposition side, I think if we can let the civic society, let's say the uh, Syrian Red Crescent, uh, be the agent of uh, connection between these two sides, I think that will happen. Mm -hmm. And it's happening in Aleppo, it's happening in Idlib. Uh, especially with vaccination. There was some cross-line uh, uh, humanitarian assistance lately mm -hmm. in the city of Azaz also, which is good and promising. And hopefully we can push more toward that. Great, thank you. Len, how do you get planning for the reconstruction? Where do you, where do you, where do you house that? How do you, who leads on that? How do you trigger that? I mean, it has to be, if you want to get planning going early, in the Balkan Wars, it was a matter of recruiting in experts and moving them outside of the immediate war zone area and having them sit down for extended periods and plan. How would that happen in this context and where? I think it has to be Syrian driven. Uh, I think one of the lessons in the Balkans is the fact that it was run by international groups, had a huge impact on the development of the health system that was not very productive, that uh, it ended up uh, without participation of, uh, in Kosovo, for example, with the, the Kosovo medical community and, and citizens, and it didn't work out. So it's got to be Syrian driven. At the same time, I think uh, there has to be some role for the international community in committing resources, in providing support. Uh, WHO right now is not 
engaged in, in thinking about this because they're so consumed with the immediate humanitarian needs, which is understandable. But I think that uh, process has to begin. And obviously many countries, including the U.S., can provide support for this effort. But I think it's got to be uh, engaging uh, Syrians. The Ministry of Health is still functioning, and Zahir can uh, 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 speak to that, too. Well, we started an effort like this, and uh, you know, I agree with that, that uh, Syrian organizations have to do it. The problem is connecting what's happening in the diaspora, uh, Syrian diaspora, um, which is leading the um, relief effort, and what's happening inside Syria. Uh, there is this connection because of security reasons, because the fact that government prevents these type of uh, connections from happening. Uh, six months ago, I attended a post-crisis recovery uh, session for healthcare in uh, Beirut, and it was or organized by UN ESQA, United Nations. And there was a very reasonable uh, working group, and it has individuals representing organizations from the inside and the outside, including the Syrian Red Crescent. Dr. Attar was there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was only the first, the only meeting that we attended. They were supposed to have a blueprint coming out of this meeting later on, and I haven't heard about what happened since then. We formed a, a coalition called Syrian International Coalition for Health to plan for the post-crisis recovery and health care. The problem that without support, whether it's financial or uh, expertise uh, the, or WHO support, this effort will stop because everyone is consumed with what's happening right now. Whether it's the bombing or the chemical weapon attack or uh, the medical supply to this area, uh, catastrophes are happening on a daily basis. So it's very difficult to plan ahead unless you have the resources available and the expertise also available. And it's very difficult to find only Syrian expertise for post-crisis recovery. We need to have the help of the international community and uh, our government here also. Thank you. I'd like to invite our audience to come forward with comments and questions. We have uh, 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 microphones that we can, we can bring forward. Please just introduce yourself briefly and offer a brief comment or question. And we'll bundle together three or four uh, uh, opening remarks. Yes, please. Thank you very much for informing us. Uh, my name is Narmina Molazada. I'm originally from uh, Eastern Europe and also I'm a medical doctor. <clears throat> and for me, it's a burden issue because I witnesses uh, Chechnya, Azerbaijan, Moldova, and uh, other regions. And it's very unfortunately that Russia taking this uh, part because as uh, yesterday and today they're celebrating World War II victory and they know how much it was cost to, to win this war. And now they're supporting uh, Assad regime. So, and also I would like to ask, uh, because <clears throat> doctors kind of always as a neutral part in the society, is it any, could be a negotiation trade-off with Assad regime to prevent attacking to the medical facility and medical doctors and nurses? Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, questions, Cameron? Yes. Marcus? Uh, Marcus. Yes. Marcus Geiser from the International Committee of the Red Cross. First of all, uh, congratulations to CSIS to having, having organized this, this excellent event. Yes, and thanks for all the excellent contributions. I have just one very specific question, and uh, our colleague and friend from MSF alluded to it about the uh, delivery of healthcare in Lebanon. Uh, we uh, from the ICRC, of course, are also trying to help uh, wounded uh, coming into Lebanon. What is your reading of the excess of, of wounded, uh, be it civilians, uh, combatants, alleged combatants sometimes, from Syria, for example, into Lebanon? Can they freely move? I'm not talking about the security problems on the road that they may encounter but really the problems of authorities, of communities being in the, the wrong part of Lebanon, because Lebanon, of course, being a very, uh, a very diverse society, as if you could allude to that particular aspect. A little Marcus, bit you're talking about uh, wounded combatants? I'm talking about any wounded, civilian or combatant, yes. Entering Lebanon entering from Lebanon, Syria yes, and really then navigating yes. the territory. Yep. Sorry if I wasn't clear enough, but that's, that's what I would Lebanon like to do. territory within Lebanon in terms of their access yep. and like. Any other questions or comments at this point? 
Yes, right here. Hi, thank you, and I appreciate very much the... Please identify yeah, I'm yourself. I'm sorry, I'm Jay Harmon. I'm an international health specialist with the Air Force, and I appreciate the comments very, very much. Um, the question or one of the things that I'm looking at is uh, the key of Russian uh, support of Assad, and what I don't know is their um, Russian involvement in civil society organizations, NGOs, that you may be able to use that as a way to pressure the Russian government uh, to help in this. Um, I see as long as it's a military strategy to attack healthcare workers, it's gonna be very difficult to change that. And so that's what I'm wondering, is whether there's a civil society within Russia helping with MSF or helping with other NGOs that may be a place to really push this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other? Cameron, over here. Uh, <clears throat> Cameron Hume, thank you very much for doing this. I, none of you mentioned sectarian issues. And <clears throat> when you uh, discussed refugees going into the Baka in particular, Baka's essentially controlled by Hezbollah, mm -hmm. not the Lebanese government. And uh, recently we've seen a ramping up of the tensions between or the role of Hezbollah and the tensions between the Shia and the Sunni more widely in the region. To what extent has the sectarian splits fueled the problems that you're describing? And more importantly, to what extent would there be a possibility to involve sectarian leaders in counteracting some of this inhumanity? Thank you. Thank you very much. Sahir, would you like to I'd like to address uh, the, the first point, yeah. uh, the first question. Um, th I think that would be great if you have at least uh, a collaboration between physicians and the uh, side of the opposition and the, the other side. The problem that uh, it's, it's very difficult and it's dangerous. If you are a physician or administrator who is working in the opposition area, let's say running a hospital or a clinic, then that means uh, your sentence is death. Um, if you are caught on the other side, you will be killed, sometimes on the spot, sometimes you're going to be detained and tortured. And this is reality. Uh, so it's very difficult for uh, administrator on the government area to collaborate or to communicate regularly with their colleagues, probably, who work together maybe for tens, uh, 10 years or 10, 20 years in the same ministry or same department, let's say, in a university, uh, because uh, of the threat on their lives. Uh, that is not happening uh, frequently, unfortunately. What about engaging sectarian leaders? Cam Cameron's question around, you know, the... This is happening on a small scale, especially in the, some of the mixed areas uh, that you have, uh, for example, um, a Kurdish and uh, Arab uh, population, Turkmen population. Sometimes you have areas where you have Shia and Christian and the uh, uh, Muslim population, especially in the city of Aleppo. The city of Aleppo is a very diverse city. So you have Armenians, you have Christians uh, of different uh, affiliations, you have Kurdish, you have Arabs, you have Turkmen, um, all of them living in this city. So there is kind of, uh, uh, kind of engagement of their leaders uh, to help in some of the local issues. Mm -hmm. And some of the local uh, civic councils that is formed in, this, in the villages and the cities and the, under the control of the opposition have, uh, a have leadership which is mixed also. Uh, there are also some effort to engage um, Alawite, for example, uh, especially in, from Latakia and Tartus uh, leader to make sure that they understand that uh, they are not tied to the regime um, in Antakya. Antakya has a, a reasonable Alawite uh, population also. Um, but it is not leading anywhere. Uh, there was a recent conference, for example, in, in Cairo that is organized by the Alawite Syrian community. And uh, they said that we're not tied to the regime, we're not responsible of what's happening. Because the Syrian government or the regime has been trying from the beginning to label the conflict as a sectarian conflict. And actually, it's succeeding in some areas. In some of the areas that I visited, the bitterness toward the other side is very high. And I am afraid of what happens after the end of this crisis. I'm, I am afraid of the retaliation. Because if you, have a from, from, if you are from family that lost your sons or daughters, was raped by someone from the next village, and you know that person, 
uh, then it's uh, very difficult to predict what will happen in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the next phase. Uh, unless you have a very clear and well-planned transitional ju justice system. Um, there is some effort on that uh, front, but it is not the, what, what we would like to see. Yes, Stephen? Uh, on that point, um, you mentioned uh, the inability for doctors to make these links uh, between maybe the big divides. Uh, but you also uh, pointed out um, doctors that are able to make those links in some of the smaller areas. You, you mentioned El Bab, you mentioned uh, Aleppo. And I think both for the medical uh, personnel as well as for humanitarians, that ensuring to make as many of these bridges and links and to widen those uh, during the current phase of the conflict will only pay dividends later because people will not, you can't just assist impartially once it becomes a sectarian conflict if that is uh, in the cards and it's, it's uh, one of the prognostic possibilities. Uh, so for, I mean, for humanitarian purposes, you should do it anyways. But uh, for, for, for doctors or for others, uh, I, I think bridging those gaps now uh, will allow in a, at least sort of a secondary level contact that can then um, have some trust to it, have an established link, and will be able to be a, a, a channel of dialogue and, and a decency if things do uh, spread and become much more difficult after in a sectarian sense. In, should I go on to the, yes, the, yes. the question from, from Marcus at the, at the Red Cross? Um, I, I'll say a few things, and I'll widen the, the response, if you don't mind, to a, a few countries, uh, rather than only being very, very specific. Um, but I think Lebanon is, is slightly uneven, given that it has open and closed different border points, so it makes it more or less difficult to, uh, for that to be an evacuation route, especially on a, on a civilian side, because Lebanon has a, a, a private health care system. So you have to pay for the care once you get there. And that's uh, a bridge too far probably for, for many uh, on the civilian side, uh, certainly as far as receiving large numbers. Um, for the uh, combatant side, I think they've done a fairly good job, as in most conflict areas, of, of uh, setting up uh, rear base referral in a number of surrounding countries and, and have a lot of uh, means at their disposition and a lot of assistance. Uh, on the uh, Turkish border and, and on other borders, it's also very uneven. In Turkey, it's a public system, so very good care if you can get there, but very uneven as to what a referral is, what an emergency is, and who gets to go across and who doesn't. Uh, so from some borders, uh, you're in an ambulance and you're on your way, and others, it's, it's, it's quite a struggle. Uh, but they are doing a much better job of, uh, of extending uh, emergency and referral care to, to civilians than, uh, than you would see on the Lebanese side. Dorothy, if, if the countries in the region, the neighboring countries, are already excessively burdened and afraid, and they're seeing this, this changing their own internal dynamics, um, they see, as Cameron suggested, a sort of fueling exacerbation of, of sectarian tensions, and they see another, a second wave, a second deluge coming in, in their direction how would you predict they're going to behave in terms of trying to mitigate or preempt either effectively or completely counterproductively in this next phase? Because we're at this moment where the, you know, the, the word is out that this is coming. The, nec you know, the next deluge is coming. And you know, the Israeli actions last weekend were in some ways motivated by this very same prospect with a heavy security dimension to it of, of the, the bombings. Um, but what, how do you see this breaking out within the regional behavior? Well, first of all, it's critical that the governments and the people of the neighboring countries understand and have confidence in, uh, in a comfort zone that they are not in this alone. They need the support of the international community, and they need to know it's not going to just be there today, but it's going to be there six, eight months from now. It'll be there in a potential worst case scenario that people have described, for example, if there's a battle for Damascus and you have you know half a million people moving in a 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. um, or if <coughs> there is a, a, a large scale uh, chemical uh, weapon event that would also you know there are various scenarios that people have talked about. 
And so we have encouraged our partners uh, to engage in very robust contingency planning for their own right, but also with those neighboring governments so that they're prepared. And that gives them the confidence. Uh, they, they need to see that the, the funding is on the line as well. By the way, I should mention that new appeals are expected to come out uh, for both inside Syria and the regional response, either at the end of this month or early next month. Um, so that's number one, to know that they're not alone. But um, you know, we also need to think about, are there some creative solutions that we haven't yet put on the table? Uh, and I have participated in some discussions with partners. Uh, and there are no easy answers here, but you know, some of the neighboring governments have wanted to explore would it be possible to do an evacuation, uh, even if it's of a symbolic number of the you know, total number of several hundred thousand refugees to a, to a third country? Uh, mm -hmm. This was done in Kosovo, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult to do for, for countries like us in a post 9-11 world. But we need to put creative options on the table. Can I take the, the floor to address a couple things that yes, were said by, by others, too? I want to let you know, Steve, that we have been hounding UNHCR, and they have been responding to ramp up their registration efforts. And as of last Friday, at the meeting I attended with them in Geneva, they have gotten down to 30-day waiting periods in everywhere but South Lebanon, where it's still 60 days. But that's better than the four months we were at. I mean, they have put on the ground virtual registration factories. And um, so they have more work to do, but we're seeing some progress. Um, I also want to address, and, and, I, and I identify very much with what you were saying about uh, the needs basis for humanitarian assistance and how we need to adhere to that strictly. Um, my concern is that sometimes the argument can be flipped on its head and there can be almost a facile uh, assumption that just because a civilian is in a government controlled uh, city or village they are less deserving than a civilian in an opposition control. I'm not saying that you were suggesting that, but I want to get out there for the, the wider group that we, in working with our partners, uh, are constantly uh, asking them to make sure they're adhering to the needs basis, neutrality, impartiality, um, and that extends whether to government-controlled or opposition-controlled areas. And we are hungry, and they are even more hungry, for information about gaps. So to the extent that those of you who are on the ground or who have people on the ground and those of you out there too who have information about these communities and we know they're out there who haven't gotten squat up until now, you know, let us feed that information into the machine and try to address it. Thank you. Thank you. I have one small point on this and it'll, it'll help out your, your point and it's often not seen, um, uh, certainly we're not trying to, to start a facile argument at all because that's not the point. And, uh, those who are working in Damascus have a whole number of um, added difficulties in being able to work there, to keep yeah. their visas, to keep everything going. Uh, and UNHCR, for one, is still dealing with a million Iraqi refugees uh, from a previous conflict. So it's, it's certainly not going to be easy for them to just roll out the punches and start doing things uh, in, a, in a more cavalier way. Right. We're at an, at an advantage that, that we can do that, and, and that's how together the, the humanitarian system ends up balancing itself out. Right. Uh, but we fully respect uh, the work of, the UN, of UNICEF, of UNHCR, of, of the Red Crescent. They're, they're doing an, very important work. The difficulty is that, that they're sort of cloistered on their side, and we're a little bit cloistered on our side, and we're not able, both of us, right to pass through and to end up bringing assistance where it's needed most, when it's needed most. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the difficulty that, uh, that I think does need explaining. Yeah. Len, you raised the question around the ICC on the criminal court getting active now. How could that be triggered to a higher level in terms of raising the specter of accountability as a way of putting people on notice? Well, I think the first thing to do is to raise it as an issue. <laughs> that you've got to put it out there before there can be any action. There has to be some discussion and, and uh, consideration that this is important. The governments think this is important and they will push it forward. Whether it could be included in a, uh, a Security Council resolution on Syria, should one take place about disarmament or other things that are being discussed right now with the Russians, I don't know, but that's the first thing uh, is to put it on the table. And that's how sometimes, think of Darfur, no one thought there could be a Security Council referral to the ICC in Darfur, but it, it happened. 
And the only way it's going to happen is if you push it. Just on two other little points, uh, they're not little at all, they're, they've been adequately discussed. Marcus's question, I think there are reports that in Lebanon, sectarian, uh, a, a sectarian basis for providing health care for people coming from Syria is becoming an issue, mm -hmm. and it could become a much bigger issue, and we ignore it at our peril. And the second, about the refugee flow, I think it was alluded to here, but I think it's worth underlying that the stability issue that you raised, Steve, is very much tied to the level of humanitarian uh, commitment by donor communities. And they really go hand in hand. Thank you. We're going to go f to our audience for another round. Ron, and then Mark. Others? Do we have others who are interested? Ron. Thanks. Ron Wildman, uh, George Washington University and Doctors of the World USA. I, I wanted to come back to an issue that has been raised already, but maybe I, I would really like to spend a little bit more time for the panelists to spend a little bit more time discussing it. And that is that we've been involved in too many situations where there's a conflict and an emergency response that goes on for a certain period of time, and then it ends. And then the next day, the planning for the stabilization, the return, the reconstruction, and the rehabilitation begins. So we have this notion of, uh, you know, relief to development transitions that are the rage now in, uh, in our circles. I, I really would like to hear some more if there are any ideas about how, when the planning should begin, whether or not the U.S. government and others are making concrete investments and in planning for reconstruction afterwards. Because if not, unnecessary preventable mortality is going to continue far longer than it should. There's an area where organizations like SAM should be very, very active and in fact perhaps in the lead. It would really be a shame if one day after the emergency needs are met to the extent that they possibly can be and some sort of peace returns to the region if for months and months and even years after that excess preventable morbidity and mortality continues to occur because there hasn't been adequate upfront planning to develop any of the six elements of that WHO calls um, fundamental to health systems. Um, I really, and this is something I think that can be taking place outside of the conflict theater now. Uh, it's not necessary for the same people to even be involved. It would be great if the same organizations were involved. But starting now to develop concrete plans, including concrete budgeting, concrete plans for human resources, concrete plans for pharmaceutical resupply, concrete plans for even governance and leadership that might take place in the medical and public health communities over and above what if a political solution is found. Seems to me that this is an ideal opportunity in some ways, as sad as it is to say, for us to do something right in this situation. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Yeah. Mark? Thanks very much. It's on. Okay. Mark. <coughs> Mark Steinbeck with the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, Dr. Seher, you mentioned atropine. Of course, for a physician, we know about atropine. If anyone here is not a physician, you watch the movie The Rock, you know that mm. when you're exposed to a chemical agent, you self-inject atropine intracardiac-wise. And I was thinking, 10 years ago, I found myself in Baghdad, and one of the things which sanctions had done was basically bleed out surgical tubing and atropine because these were dual use, and we were supplying huge amounts of atropine and surgical tubing. Are you implying with your comment that perhaps the government has been stockpiling atropine or it's just being used up or there's just not enough getting into the country? Uh, it, it depends on maybe after that. Um, hold for one second. Are there other comments or questions just now? Okay, why don't we come to Zahir. Okay, well, you know, a couple of comments. Uh, regarding the question about atropine, it depends on the area. So definitely the, you have areas where you have a huge shortage, like Damascus uh, and the Reef Damascus. And uh, we purchased recently 20,000 uh, ampules uh, from the pharmacies there, but at higher price than the rest of the market in mm -hmm. Syria. 
and we stocked it in a warehouse in East Ghouta because many people in Daraya and these areas are expecting a chemical weapon attack in that area. Uh, it is available in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan. Uh, it is available in uh, some of the pharmacies in Aleppo. So you can pur purchase it from the local market. It's expensive and you need to, uh, you know, basically uh, provide them with the price so they can purchase it. Um, and also the issue of transportation, because even after we purchased the, uh, the, the amount in uh, the ampules in Damascus, it took some time to transport them from Damascus to East Ghouta. It took a few weeks because of the blockade in, uh, in, in these areas. Um, in terms of the first comment, I, what was the, the first comment uh, about? Ron, Ron uh, Waldman's question around planning for the reconstruction. Planning, I mean, I, mean, I agree completely with you. Uh, the, you know, uh, looking at previous conflicts, uh, <coughs> many times the healthcare indicators deteriorate right after the end of the conflict. Uh, and mortality rate actually increases because of the disintegration of the healthcare system and pu public health care. Uh, in some of the area, and you have a window of two to three years where you really, uh, either that you make it and the indicators start to come up or you don't make it. Some uh, countries like uh, Haiti, for example, did not make it. Uh, there was no adequate planning. There was no um, maybe infrastructure in the civic societies um, that uh, can sustain or build on the planning. Uh, although there was a lot of goodwill in, from the international community in the case of Haiti. Uh, in Syria, we're not seeing the goodwill and we're not seeing uh, the uh, adequate, consistent communication between uh, stakeholders or players from the outside and the inside. In order to plan, you need to know who will be implementing the plan next. And the problem that no one knows right now in Syria, who will be in the driver's seat uh, after the end of the crisis. Uh, is it a, a technocrat government? Is it... Uh, the regime is it a combination of the regime and the opposition. So that's why you have these hurdles. Besides, there is no international will to help the Syrian organizations to, to do this planning. But you could have potentially a, 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 a neutral organization. You could have a World Bank or mm -hmm. any number of organizations provide the, the hosting function for a, a, a group of expert Syrians that re are representative of a, a certain spectrum that would in collect facts and begin thinking about this. I mean, it sounds like that's already process has already begun. And in UN as well. Right. There's a problem. Um, well, first of all, Ron, you're completely right uh, that this has to be thought about now. When we talk about this so-called relief to development continuum and wars in recent years, much of the discussion has been in countries with very poor infrastructure to begin with. South Sudan, Liberia, um, DRC, Afghanistan, and that is, in a way, the model people have used. We're starting from scratch. Syria had a functioning health system, and it wouldn't take a starting from scratch approach to get the health system back up. The, the, the good, the bad example, or the example of how not to proceed is Iraq, where uh, we don't, we don't want to have a whole discussion, but it was done extremely poorly with a very centralized uh, system with uh, kind of show hospitals and uh, uh, not really um, uh, consideration or consultative process. In Syria, you did have a system. You have people who are working in the system, who know the system. You have uh, a lot of human capital that could go into planning if there were support internationally. And then, to me, the huge issue I mentioned before is the human resources issue, because so many people have fled, and how are you going to rebuild that capacity, and how are people going to be able to live in an environment when they've been traumatized? But these can be addressed as well if planning started now. Dorothy, you wanted to say something? I would Steven? just note that, indeed, these planning efforts are ongoing. It sounds like there may be several and maybe they need to be coordinated. I know the um, Syrian Opposition's uh, Assistance Coordination Unit uh, is looking at this longer term horizon mm -hmm. of reconstruction, for example. Um, there have been discussions among donors. Uh, it was the EU Commissioner for Development and Humanitarian Assistance, Kristalina Georgieva, who recently made the rounds in Washington 
and talked about a broader political initiative that would bring in the World Bank and the, the international financial institutions, that would bring in development actors and would bring in private sector actors. I mean, really looking at this on a grand scale on mm -hmm. um, how to get to that reconstruction phase. In talking to the UN last week, the, um, and the question was raised, okay, there's an, inter, there's an interagency, inter-UN committee looking at reconstruction as health on the agenda. The answer was no. The answer was it's focused upon the reviving, revitalizing the economy, dealing with security, and dealing with governance. That health was, on, was, was perhaps nom nominally cited. So I hear, uh, Stephen, I'll get to you in just one moment. I wanted to first ask Zahir, what do you think the prospects are for getting those, the 50% of your medical, your, your doctor base that have stopped practicing and most of them have exited? What's the prospects in your view of coming back? There's great variation in these situations in the degree to which people migrate back home. And obviously, if this becomes speculative and much of it is contingent on the security and how, to what degree schools and other th schools and economy and basic security is restored in order to get people back to agree to come home. But what's your own sense of what the prospects are? Um, I think this is a great question. Um, I just want to highlight the issue that Syria is not like other countries like the Congo, for example. Uh, Syria has very uh, successful healthcare system b to start with. Um, we had 30,000 physicians, so the ratio of physicians to uh, population is about 1 to 1,000 or 1 to 900, which is very reasonable. The healthcare indicators in Syria, which is mostly was middle class before the crisis, was very reasonable in terms of uh, child mortality and, and all of these things. Um, and uh, the um, Syrian uh, universities are known to, um, to produce good doctors. Uh, Bashar al-Assad is not one of them, by the <laughs> way. Um, so, but but um, there is a lot of excitement, by the way, in spite of the desperation and the disastrous uh, um, situation in Syria, among the Syrian expatriate and the diaspora community to go back and build. And I know that there is a large percentage of physicians and uh, other uh, professionals will be excited to go back and build when safety uh, is not an issue. Um, Within the healthcare community, uh, for a physician who fled Syria uh, in the last two years and started working, let's say, in the Gulf states or in Europe, it's very difficult for them to go back. Mm -hmm. So definitely maybe there will be 20%, um, 25% of physicians who will not go back at all because they found a life, they have established job, and it's going to take some time to build what ha has been destroyed in Syria. But many of them are excited. Many of the rest who, who left Syria are excited to go back either because they're not working right now in Turkey and Iraq and Lebanon and Jordan, they, they're not, they don't have license to work and the government are not allowing them to work, or because they, are, they want to go back and be uh, part of this uh, building uh, generation. Um, and many organizations, uh, many of my colleagues who've been outside of Syria for 30 years and 40 years and 20 years also are planning to go back when the crisis ends. So uh, there is a lot of hope, but it needs a support of the international community and a platform for them to, uh, to coordinate their work. Thank you. Stephen, you had some thoughts, and then I want to come back and close with asking each of you for just one last final thought about what you want us to take away as the sort of top line priority looking forward. Stephen, you had some thoughts yeah, on some a, of the questions it's raised? Just a small uh, seed, perhaps, of, of uh, hope to this reconstruction side, and that is that um, Aleppo having been the uh, pharmaceutical capital for mm -hmm. the country uh, and the industrial zone having not been attacked during this war, it's been, it's been kept unscathed. Uh, so there could be a common point of interest between business, uh, between uh, medicine and between um, whatever government is, is in place after that, that would have a number of reasons for trying to Yes. to jumpstart itself, and I think uh, there's, there's a lot of capital there that, that was not destroyed mm. and that would probably be able to be put back online, um, not seamlessly, but certainly without the type of complete rebuilding uh, that one would have seen in Iraq. So one, one small point of, of hope, perhaps. Thank you. Len, do you want to <coughs> help us end this today with a closing thought? Well, I'll close like how I opened. Thank you, Steve, for, for having this event. 
And uh, my closing thought is we, we have to move uh, from tragedy to moral outrage. Uh, nothing is going to change unless there is a demand for change. And I think uh, the entire international community must uh, raise its collective voice, and that means citizens as well as governments. Uh, that's how, the only way this could possibly change. Thank you. Stephen? Just uh, two things. One, also to, to thank uh, CSIS for putting on this, this debate, a very important debate that, that is larger than Syria, and I think that's, mm -hmm. that's very important, uh, to raise the issues of, of health care um, under attack in, in so many different conflicts around the world. And, and unless we start uh, to rebuild, and not just uh, with the rhetoric, but actually with the real fundaments of, of humanitarian law and respect for uh, medical personnel, for civilians, for, for humanitarians, we, we are really putting ourselves at risk in the long term. I think um, in looking at, at, at Syria itself, um, I, I, I can't stress enough how much uh, that moral outrage that you spoke about is, is required. We, we together are all doing our best, but our best is not enough at this stage, and uh, we clearly uh, must do uh, a lot more um, in order to at least meet the very basic life-saving needs of Syrians uh, over the next uh, number of months, and then, of course, get on to this very important uh, reconstruction and the, and the after. But in, in the short term, uh, we really have to have a concerted effort with the host countries. Uh, they need real support. They need technical support. Uh, they may not be asking for all the types of support that they need, uh, but clearly, they, they are, are in, in many cases, almost turning into humanitarian situations themselves. And if we don't help them realize that before it's too late, that we might have an even bigger crisis on our hands. Thank you. Dorothy. I'm going to invoke um, the heads of the four UN humanitarian agencies who did an editorial uh, jointly in the New York Times a couple weeks ago that I think it was titled, Enough. Enough. Um, they're really calling for a political solution to this war because there is no humanitarian solution. And we are going to do our best uh, as the United States and the gov uh, government and the partners that we fund. Uh, but we are constantly playing catch up and it's uh, incredibly frustrating because we want to do better. Uh, and in part, I think we can do better by taking advantage of the local resources that the host governments have. They're also highly educated populations. So again, we don't need to go in there with all of the, the outside experts, but we need to do a better job of taking advantage of local expertise in responding to the refugee crisis. Thank you. So here. Um, you get the benediction. <laughs> okay. Well, that's tough, very tough. But I just want to mention that uh, in, in my multiple visits, and I'm sure that Steve would share, share that with me, to Syria, uh, what I've seen that the, the population in light of the stress, in light of the bombing and the shelling and the suffering, but they are overcoming many of the hurdles that we are talking about. And they are doing that because of their perseverance. Because they are doing that with minimal support from the international community uh, because of the creativity that the Syrian people has and because they believe in Syria. And Syria can be a model to the rest of the Middle East, I believe, because Syria has the ingredients for success as a country. It has diversity, it has educated population, it has a human capital, uh, it has a uh, relatively uh, functioning uh, system in terms of civic society to start before the crisis, and it continued and it got empowered now because of the crisis. So we need to focus on these uh, uh, ingredients of success, the civic society, the NGO, local NGO uh, organization, and uh, also the educated class. Uh, doctors in Syria had always leading role. Uh, and if we can focus on physicians and empower them, make sure that they uh, have what it takes to overcome this crisis, I think that will be very helpful. Uh, some of you maybe have seen the clip in Gray's uh, Anatomy, uh, which is a famous uh, uh, soap here, about uh, some of the American physicians who wanted to train their Syrian colleague on what to do in the situation when you have an austere environment, so you don't have that many things. They want to train them so they can send them back to Syria. So there was this clip where you have uh, a couple of uh, surgeons from the United States training Syrian doctors. Uh, so they told them, imagine that you are in a situation where you don't have uh, this part of surgical sets, you don't have these medications, and you don't have uh, this type of equipment. Then the Syrian physician told him, uh, well, the situation actually is much harder than, than what you're describing. So remove this, remove this, and remove that, 
and then turn off the light. <laughs> and that's what's happening in Syria. In some of the field hospital that Steve has described, uh, people are doing surgeries in caves. Uh, in some of the field hospitals I've, I've visited, they have no electricity, they have no ventilators, they have no anesthesia, uh, uh, general anesthesia for patients, they don't have blood products, and they are doing surgeries on patients, and the patients are surviving. Uh, and I think if we, if we look at the success stories in Syria, and try to maybe make Syrians hopeful of the day after, and focus on the day after, I think hopefully we can end this crisis. I th that's what we are lacking right now, because there's not many people are talking about what happens after the end of the crisis. Thank you. Well, I'm so impressed with the commitment and contributions that you're all making here. Uh, Zahir, Stephen, thank you so much for coming the distance to be with us and the work that your organizations are doing. Dorothy, thank you so much. I mean, the, the administration is doing a great deal, and it's great that you could come and be with us. And Len, thank you again for, for bringing this all forward and pulling it together so it would be possible. Please join me in thanking um, our panelists. <laughs>